Aloha. Welcome to episode five in season two. This is a double feature because I've been slacking. There are times when I need a little bit of a break. Um, so let's take a second to show some gratitude for some really awesome friends. Friends of the pod. Pod friends. Pod. Pod for life. Uh, Toad McRibbits. I'm so sorry. I don't know your real name. Um, uh, this young woman hit me up on Instagram and told me that she listened to every episode twice, which is so fucking cool. Um, I'd also like to shout out Tree Lover, someone who rolls their napkins at work while they listen to me talk about my fucking weird life. Um, someone who lives far away but is very close to my heart, Tiffany Hager. Hey girl, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being so supportive and loving and kind and man, Fuck, dude, I'm sorry, and you're great, so let's hug. Um, also want to give another shout out to Waldo, another listener, human being, awesome dude, friend. You're not a dude, you're a friend. You're my friend now. Speaking of friends, have you guys heard about my friends, Mike and Kalina? They are on my podcasting network, and they have shows that I want to tell you about. Mike is the host and the guy, the man that you come to see for Buddy of the Groom. And he is hilarious and you should check out my episode where I talk about my most recent breakup and, um, you know, a bachelor party that I'm going to throw for him potentially or not. I don't know. Find out. <laughs> and um, also you can check out Kalina Ote's podcast, Cringeworthy. So this young woman and I are friends in real life and we are actually going to get together and host an all woman LGBT empowered and friendly open mic showcase. So stay on the lookout for that if you're in Chicago if you're local if you're a woman if you're LGBT friendly maybe you want to come to our mic and you know be on my podcast and be my fucking friend and come over for dinner okay guys okay 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 um this episode is about food you know you know what food is right we all gotta eat it even in jail so Let's get into it. Let's talk about the ins and outs of the food in jail. Hang on. My name is B. Casper, and my entire life has been a lie. That's not even my real name. But don't worry, I'm going to tell you all of my secrets. This isn't the story of how I became an orphan. This isn't the story about how I jumped off a five-story building and survived. This isn't about how I died and came back funny. This is that time I got arrested. You have a certain amount of money that you're allowed to have on your books every week. Your books are like a bank account that you have while you are in prison. And there are one of two ways that you can receive this money. You can come in with it, you can get arrested, and you can have cash on your person. And all of that cash gets counted up and put on your books into your account. Or you can have a kind and generous soul set up an account online and put their credit card information in that account so that they can send you money. So I went into jail with some money, but my stepmother, my stepmother also sent me money every single week. And she knew to do this because she did it for my father the entire time that he was in prison. And she knew how important it was. And she knew how much that money could mean to someone in that situation. Most people don't understand that commissary is everything. I mean, they don't give you anything. They don't fucking feed you. They don't give you soap. They don't give you stamps. They don't give you a goddamn toothbrush. You know, all of that stuff is just like, mm, go fuck yourself. But if you have money, if you have someone send you money, it's just like the real world. I mean, money talks, you know, you can get whatever you want. And I mean, you can get drugs and you can get a television and you can get art supplies and you can get a tape player and you can get a fluffy fucking bathrobe if you have money. I had money. So, you know, I was in a really fortunate position and I was in a really fortunate position because of my really fucked up pedigree. Don't don't get mad about it. <laughs> Don't get mad about it because I do realize how 
fucking lucky I was. When I got to Cook County, I had a couple of hundred dollars that I had on my person. And after that, my stepmother would send me a hundred dollars every week. So I had a good bit of money. The reason why she sent me a hundred dollars every week was because that was the most that you could spend. You could only spend a hundred dollars every week, but you have to imagine that everything you're buying is pretty cheap. So a hundred dollars worth of food and stamps and calling cards, um, it goes a long way, goes a long way. I mean, I definitely couldn't live off of a hundred dollars a week now in my real life, but while I was in prison for that 11 months and three weeks, that was exactly what I did. So while I was in Cook County, you guys know, I developed quite a um, <laughs> serious pill pill habit and I spent almost all of that money on lists, grocery lists that the lady who I bought pills from would provide for me. Shout out big baby and all those oxys. And I would buy everything that she wanted. And then I would give her all of that stuff. And then she would give me the pills. So typically the things that were the most expensive and um, were the most requested were stamps and calling cards. At Cook County, the list of what you could buy was not that great. I mean, it was basically potato chips and candy bars and hard, like no name brand candy and stamps and calling cards. That was the stuff that was really sought after because calling cards meant that you could call people and, you know, connect with the outside world. And stamps meant that you could do personal business and write people and um, send things to your lawyer and things that were actually important and mattered. So the stuff that you could buy in Cook County was very basic and very practical. So that was what all of my money was spent on. And I was there for about three months. Then I went to Dwight. Dwight was a maximum security prison. And there the list was pretty extensive, but because I was only there for a short period of time and because I wasn't technically in the maximum security part of the prison, I was just in the holding place place where they assign your security clearance. So that's whether you're minimum or medium or maximum, they have a whole separate group of cells. And because you're in a whole separate group of cells, you have a whole separate list of commissary, but it was still pretty lengthy. And it was cookies and candies and potato chips and you could get soda and you could get ramen. I know anyone who has approached me about a commissary episode up until this point has like said something to me. Oh, you ate a lot of ramen. Yes, I ate a lot of ramen. I ate so much fucking ramen at one point in my life. I literally had it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner because they don't fucking feed you in prison. Not only do they not feed you, but their food is garbage. It is basically inedible. They get a certain budget. The warden gets a budget from the state of how much they're allowed to spend on food. And they have like a caloric requirement that they are supposed to meet for every meal. So every single person is required to get a minimum of 1200 calories per day. But the way that they like meet this caloric requirement while also feeding you garbage and spending the least amount of money possible is they give you bullshit like jello for every single meal. And that's like a part of your caloric requirement. You know, they give you like canned everything. They give you like soy replacement meat. I mean, just, you know, food that um, you wouldn't want to eat if you're starving. <laughs> and uh, they they are all starving you. So you have to eat it, but it's still like not even enough to fully sustain you. And guess what? When you're like not doing shit all day and you're sitting in a room staring at a wall, um, you get really hungry for no reason. So the way that you supplement that hunger, the way that you like alleviate that boredom is that you go to commissary and you buy all of this garbage. So it's processed, um, crappy, sugary, GMO laden, um, food, garbage, garbage food, everything you could essentially buy at a 7-Eleven. So I'm talking beef jerky. I'm talking Skittles. I'm talking Reese's peanut butter cups as the days are long. Pepsis and Mountain Dew, no Coke. Cause I mean, why enjoy yourself? <laughs> why can't, can't 
can't have anything good. Um, so yeah, Pepsi, Diet Pepsi, Mountain Dew, um, everything crappy you could ever possibly imagine, and ramen. Oh, so much ramen. And when I got to Dwight, I mean, I really started to change inside of my mind and my headspace as far as my relationship with food was concerned. Up until that point, I mean, everything that I ate was plant-based, organic, like high quality, oh God, like vegetables and like superfoods. You know, I was a vegan before I went to prison. And while I was in prison, all I ate was um, the worst possible food that a human being could consume. I mean, the stuff that they give to like lab rats and they grow huge giant tumors all over their body. That's what I ate all day, every day. And food was a way for me to harm myself, but it was also a way for me to protect myself. And before food to me was this part of my life that was used as like nourishment and, and a way to thrive, not only to like survive, you know, food is fuel, but food was also like a, a healing element in my life. But while I was in prison, it was quite the opposite. Not only was it a way for me to punish myself, but the more weight that I gained, the less attractive I was to the prison guards who were, you know, inappropriate at best. (laughs) So in 11 months and three weeks, I gained 80 pounds, 80 pounds. I'm five, three and a half. (laughs) So much weight. And when I got out of prison, I mean, I went on a juice fast like right away and like lost like the 20 in the first like month. But my relationship with food and my relationship with my body was never the same. And that was where it really started was with the commissary and with the self-harm. And now I'm the type of person where I don't wear like sexy clothes. And like, I do try really hard to like have a healthy and like loving relationship with my body, but I'm still kind of in a place where if a guy like compliments me on my figure or anything, I'm just immediately disgusted and like want to like throw up all over them. And the only type of guys that I ever sleep with now are guys that are very cerebral and have to really like get in my heart and my head um, first way, way, way before they could ever like get in my pants. When a guy like hits on me, I'm like, ew, get the fuck away from me. But if a guy like writes me a poem and like, or like a love letter, I'm like, okay, I'll, we'll take off all my clothes for you. So that's really how this like food relationship changed the way that I like view myself and like um, experience life. And it all started with all of this fucking junk food and all of the commissary, all of that hundred dollars a week. So there's like a pretty strong racial divide in prison and it sucks, but it is so fucking real. Every, you know, single race pretty much sticks to themselves. There's a group of black girls, there's a group of Latina girls, and there's a group of white girls and they all kind of hate each other as sad as that is you know they don't see anyone as being like on their team as far as like women are concerned you know there is no intersectional feminism in prison unfortunately um everyone is in their own group and you are assigned a group based on how you look and how you behave so I'm Hispanic. That's not something that I have ever admitted openly throughout the course of my life, mostly because um, there were Colombian gangsters that were trying to kill me. But um, I have never openly said to most people until pretty recently that I'm Cuban. I'm half Cuban. I'm half Cuban and I'm half white. And I know you can hear the sound of my voice. So I sound more white than Cuban, right? I know I do. Um, I know I do because all of the Hispanic girls in prison would look at me and, you know, assume that I had some Hispanic heritage because when you look at me, you can kind of tell I have dark hair and I have dark eyes and I have a slightly olive skin tone. So when I meet someone who is Hispanic, they'll almost immediately start speaking Spanish to me because they assume that I'm 
Hispanic, which they're correct in assuming that. But what they're incorrect in assuming is that I'm fluent in Spanish. Um, yo entiende, pero no habla. So I understand, but um, I don't really speak Spanish. So I'm always kind of like, uh, yo no sé. And then they call me a coconut. <laughs> uh, yeah. So a coconut is like a derogatory term for a Hispanic person who is brown on the outside and white on the inside. Kind of like um, if you were to call someone an Oreo or like a Twinkie. It's like that sort of insult, which um, I never even took that personally. Honestly, at that point, they call me a coconut. I'm like, dude, I like coconuts. Like, it's chill. Coconut LaCroix is my favorite flavor. <laughs> Everyone thinks it tastes like sunscreen. I think it tastes delicious. So um, I was a coconut and I was excluded from the like Hispanic group of women in the prison system. And the black girls hated me because I was like the epitome of white privilege, you know, getting a hundred dollars every week with my fucking vocabulary and my books. And you know what I mean? Like I was that bitch and, um, I was hated so much. And the way that they would express their hate was in the form of physical violence. So I got beat up a lot. I got beat up a lot and I got beat up consistently by the same group of people. And because I didn't belong to any specific group, um, because the white girls were, um, how shall I say, awful. Um, the white women were awful. So, you know, I'm like a little brown, but I'm also like, you know, very white seeming. So I didn't really fit in, in either camp, you know, I was kind of like a lone wolf, which is pretty much how I've been my whole life. But in this situation where it's a lot of groupthink and it's a lot of survivalism, that is the most dangerous situation you could be in. So eventually I did get moved to a minimum security prison. I went to a prison called Lincoln and I was there for the rest of my stay, which is about five months and three weeks, I want to say. Yeah, five months and three weeks at a minimum security prison. And for two and a half of those months, I was getting beat up almost daily by a group of black girls. Um, they would do really disgusting, weird, and vile things to me. But um, there, there is a way out of all of all of this, and it's money, and it's commissary money. So you could pay for protection and you could pay for um, peace of mind. You know, everything, everything has a price, whether it's your body or whether it's your money or whether it's your mind, you know, something has got to give. And I really didn't want to do this because all of the white women, all of like the really white women that are in prison, this is sad to say, because these women are getting beaten and raped and abused as well. But um, they're also really super racist, like super racist. Like a lot of them are pretty like uh, white trash, um, hillbilly sort of like Southern. Like, I don't know if you know this about Illinois, but if you're not in Chicago, you're kind of in the sticks and almost everyone like South of Chicago has a Southern accent. They grew up in some small town and they are just as racist as the very unfortunate people that I am related to. So I like know, I know those kinds of people pretty well, unfortunately. And I didn't want to be associated with them. So for two months and three weeks, I took it. I took all of those beatings hard. And um, it wasn't just that they would beat me up. Like they would like make fun of me and like tease me like mercilessly. They'd wake me up in the middle of the night. One time I woke up and this girl was literally on top of my bed, on top of my body, straddling me. And she licked my face and then she punched me. <laughs> and, like it's funny now, but in the moment being asleep and then having to wake up to that, like, fuck. I mean, I know two months maybe doesn't seem like a long time to um, 
to anyone listening, but every day felt like an eternity. So two months and three weeks in, I approached this gang of girls um, in prison and they were skinheads. They were white nationalists. They were racist. They hated Jews and they hated black people. And um, I wasn't like asked to be a part of their gang because I'm not Aryan, but I do speak white enough to have an in with one of the girls that offered this deal to me. And uh, like I said, I wasn't a part of their gang and I definitely, definitely did not believe anything that they, you know, held into their hearts and in their minds. But I, um, I paid them to protect me from the black girls eventually. And I'm super ashamed of that. But like I said, it was just about survival. And after everything up until that point, it was like my last 90 days in jail. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what did it. I'll tell you what broke me. There's this one story that I have that's kind of fucked up and I'm embarrassed to tell you guys, but this is so real. There was this girl, there was this 17 year old. Yeah, she was 17 and she was in a minimum security prison um, because she had been arrested for armed robbery and she had robbed these two older white people, um, in the gold coast and like had broken to their house and they were home and they were asleep and she like tied them up and they had a gun and they, they got arrested and she went to prison. She was tried as an adult and she went to prison, but man, this girl was in the bunk next to mine and she was awful. God, she was so awful. She was so fucking smart because she could find like the most innocuous things to pick apart and like she would just like say the craziest shit to me but honestly like hurt my feelings so much she was so good at hurting my feelings that I feel like she should win a fucking award but she was also super violent and really physical with me and just like hated me like she would trip me she would push me she was the one who was on top of me licking my face and punching me at 3 a.m. She was really funny and she was smart um, and she was demented. She said that the only thing that she regrets about the crime that she committed was not killing those two old people because if she had killed them, they wouldn't have been able to identify her and she would have gotten away with it. And she would like talk about committing crimes with other girls and just talk about how, you know, the next time she encountered some like old white person that she was just going to make sure she killed them before she left. So that's what prison taught her. You know, um, it's a really great, uh, system to rehabilitate people. (laughs) So one time I was coming out of the shower and I, think that that's when you're your most vulnerable and it probably like triggers a lot of like um, emotional trauma for the women there. So I don't necessarily blame them for like fucking with you while you're coming in and out of that situation. But it's also just like, man, dude, you're like naked. You're carrying all of your shit. You only have like a few moments to yourself and you're exposed. You're totally exposed. So this girl, this fucking dumb young bitch (laughs) jumped on top of me, held me down and then took a shampoo bottle and stuck it up my butt. (laughs) Oh, it's so embarrassing. Um, please don't ever fucking bring that up to me again, but that for real happened. And then after that, I paid a bunch of skinheads to protect me. (laughs) So I was getting a hundred dollars a week and I would give them 75. So like the lion's share of what I was getting sent. So my, you know, food intake went down, but man, was I less hungry after I was getting, um, the shit not kicked out of me every day and like shampoo bottles shoved inside orifices of my body. In minimum security prison, that's when you could buy like the real shit. You could buy bathrobes, you could buy a tape player, you could buy art supplies, you could buy 
a television, which was the most important thing that you could have in prison. The TV was an escape. It was your way out. It was your connection to the outside world. So TVs were everything. And I begged my stepmother for the money up front to buy a television. They were $500. They were 13 inch flat screen clear TVs. So it was completely clear. It was something that they had to do because I guess women just would get crafty and like take them apart and start electrocuting people. So they had to make them clear for whatever fucking reason. We used to make a lot of ramen. We also used to make these things called potatoes. And like, isn't this so sick that like, this was the most delicious thing that we could eat. And I like crave this now, even though I've not eaten this in almost six years, but I'm going to explain to you what a potato is. So we used to like eat potatoes and that's where you would take a giant bag of potato chips and you would crush them very fine in the bag. And then you would add to the bag um, some instant rice and cheese and cut up little slices of beef jerky and you could buy like seasoning like salt and pepper and onion powder and garlic and all that shit and you would add all of that seasoning to a potato chip bag and then you'd add a little bit of water and then you would take a rubber band and you would twist it up and you'd tie it and then we had these things called hot pots and they were basically just like instant kettles and that's how we would cook all of our ramen and we'd make tea or coffee or whatever because we didn't have a microwave or a stove or anything like that so everything that we cooked was made in these little instant like plug them into the wall kettles. So you would take that bag of chips and all that stuff and you'd let it sit in the hot water for anywhere from two to four hours. I shit you not. (laughs) Two to four hours. That's how long it would take to make like this one thing. And then it would come out in like this lump and it was so good. It was so good. It was so fucking good compared to what we were being fed on a regular basis, which was like jello and soy meat with no flavor and like canned vegetables and like canned fruit and just nothing that was like flavorful or delicious at all. So you'd eat a potato. But um, when I started paying all of these skinheads to protect me, the effect that they had on my like day-to-day life was crazy. It was crazy. I got my bunk moved into a dorm with all white women and I never got hit or punched or shoved or fucked with. No one even fucking looked at me funny because, because of these skinheads. And man, the last 90 days of my stay, while there was still other fucked up shit that happened, All I did was like read books and watch Jeopardy. So what I started doing with the remainder of that money that I had was gambling. And what I would do is I would watch Jeopardy every day at 4.30 p.m. And we would all write our answers down on a grid sheet and whoever got the most answers correct would win a honey bun at the end. And right before I was about to get out, I thought I was going to leave about two months earlier than I ended up getting released because I was going to parole at my mother's place, but she um, changed her mind at the last minute, like the day of, and I didn't have a place to parole. So I had to go to my grandparents' house, but changing your parole location at the last minute will delay your release. So I ended up having to stay in jail for about two months longer than I had anticipated. And I found out this one day that I had won Jeopardy. And so I had 10 honey buns of winnings sitting in my lap. And I ate each one in a row without even really tasting it or chewing it or even feeling it. I was just so upset. And now food was my comfort and food was also my punishment. So I was like angry and I was sad and I ate them all in the span of like 15 minutes. And then I immediately threw up. For the first time in the whole time, I was peaceful and I was okay. 
And man, I'm like grateful, grateful to my stepmother for having that money. I'm grateful to those skinheads for being available to me. And um, I'm grateful that I, you know, had the ability to buy all that food and gain all that weight and change the way that I viewed my body because I think that it's gross that we're judged based on like the sum of our appearance and like how much we sexually stimulate another man visually is like how a lot of women base their worth. And I'm grateful that I have um, a separation from that because I've had so many fucked up experiences regarding that exchange, that like mental exchange on such an extreme level that, you know, now I feel like my connections with men um, almost have to be more genuine, even if, even if it's more difficult. (laughs) I am dead inside. Um, How was this for you, you guys? I'm still recovering from the last episode. Um, How are you, though? I really love everyone who's reached out to me um, to share with me, you know, how, how I've made you feel and how you feel about your life. And I want that exchange to continue. I want to hear from you guys and I want to connect with you. And I really want um, to know about you. So please, please continue to write me and reach out to me. And Melanie, shout out to Melanie. I love you. I love you. Love you, Paige. Love you, Kate. I love you guys. Bon voyage. <laughs>